I represent an international federation called Aquafit, which is uh, bringing together more than 400 companies worldwide, focusing on service delivery on water and on sanitation services. And I was asked by my colleague Jack Moss to represent Aquafit here in this very important part of our advocacy engagement uh, together with Bordam. I want to ask a couple of questions first, just to loosen up the audience. Um, who is, ex who is in the room? Is there anybody from the business community in the room, apart from me? Yes, welcome. Okay, good to see you guys. Who is from an NGO? And an NGO from the south? Who is with uh, public authorities, local or regional? Good, that's, uh, that's, that's a nice crowd. Who is with the unions? Or who is representing workers or engineers in these utilities? Right, so I'm not an engineer either, I don't know much about the water box, but I do know that uh, we, have, we have to talk about shit here today. And, uh, and I also want to talk about something that's very dear to me, which is that we have to change the vocabulary and the way we deal with these issues. I think it will be crucial to get out of the silo if we, if we start by changing the words we use. It's not wastewater, I'm sorry, it's used water. It's about organizing successive uses of water, which is a limited resources, as we all know. Um, I'm also very humbled by the quality of the presentations that we, that we just heard and maybe my, mine will have a little bit of redundancy but I will try to reflect from a business side on what we've just heard. Um, I only represent utilities, I don't represent business as a, as a, as a, as a part of society when, and we all know that in these issues of the SDGs that are highly interconnected, business has its role to play and I think the business community stands ready if you see all these initiatives that are going on, CO water mandate, global compact, all these high level things that are being done by multinational corporations, that's all fine, that's all fantastic, but we often forget that it's the small sized, medium sized, you know, the contractors and also of course the informal sector that we're not reaching and testimony to this is that there's nobody uh, in the room, except uh, maybe two or three people who, who, can, who can actually speak about that. Um, the second point I would like to make is that together with Borna, and I think together with a whole wide range of multi-stakeholders, we've been instrumental in getting the policy decisions adopted this September. So I think we should actually congratulate ourselves for being so successful. I remember from the process and that it was incredibly intensive that we did uh, a huge number of consultations including with the generations of the future of whom I see a number of you represented here, youth um, and what came out of that in the whole let's say po pre post 2015 agenda was that sanitation used water n had never had such a high visibility and just for laughs I think we reached an audience of about 2.5 million people who read a tweet by Giselle Buntian, whom you all know <laughs> as being a fantastic uh, Brazilian colleague of ours, who also takes the cause of shit and sanitation dear to her heart. So I think that shows that we can really impact the way uh, policy is being made. Now, my speaking points for today will be about, uh, first of all, a little bit this advocacy for looking at water as a resource and the whole cycle of water. So we have to look at every single step of the of the water cycle and when it comes to sanitation or used water we, we speak about integrated used water management. I think that there is a business case to be made there at every single point given the, the, the pressures of uh, climate change, population growth and urbanization. Where we come from? I'm, I've, I've been specializing in the human right to water and sanitation. I think it's maybe interesting to recall a little bit that sanitation or used water is often the orphan in these discussions and Graham you can you can correct me if I'm wrong but there is a general comment 15 on on what it means water as a human right but for sanitation and wastewater this is long been completely misunderstood nobody had any idea it was just maybe toilets the human right to toilets since Katarina's work and since the adoption in 2010 we know it's much more than just toilets. So we have a human rights imperative, and I think that's also important to take into our discussions here. It's not only the SDG framework that's going to drive policies, and that will require authorities to go start reporting on what they're doing to achieve these, uh, these uh, fantastic goals, but there is also a human rights imperative. And why do I say that? It is because there's two things that strike me in this discussion that have converged really, really nicely over the last five years. It's two things. 
the most marginalized first, that is a moral imperative, and forever. It means there cannot be retrogression, there cannot be uh, going back, so it means that we have an incredible drive and an incredible ob obligation for our politicians to, to tackle this issue at the heart of the court. Everyone forever, it means that we cannot afford to look at the most marginalized and say, okay, we'll treat them later. That was the MDG process. It was, we just cut by half and for any sanitation and waste we didn't even reach it. But now we have to go get, go get them. And these are not the low hanging fruits. And this is not easy to achieve. This will be even more difficult. And I'm not even talking about the combined, the compounded, compounded uh, difficulties of climate change, the growing Graham showed it that the, the urbanization challenge is just incredible. So this is going to be incre incredibly difficult. So the, 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 the poorest, the marginalized, the ones that we don't see, the lack of data this is something that struck me in all these discussions that we, don't, we just don't know where they are. And this is something that I think from a business perspective or from the private sector, coming from the private sector, that can be much more done because these, I'm not talking about utilities, but these entrepreneurs that are out there, they have huge amounts of data. So I, I really think that there can be, there can be hope uh, with, for data, and especially if you look at the way these computers are evolving. So I think we will find hope in data, but we, we have to make sure that we compile it and that we compile the right data. So I think that's why this, the monitoring of the SDGs is going to be very important. The second thing is about forever, and that links up um, sustainable infrastructure. What does it mean? What does it require? How do you build this? And it's not only in the south or in the emerging megapolis of, of the world that we don't even know the names of, but it's also in the north. And we were talking last night, having a nice, uh, nice Bremen beer here. But uh, if you go, to, if you have too many beers, you have to go to the toilet. And I come from another beer drinking country, Belgium. And I have to tell you that in Flanders, 60% of all used water is untreated. Although we have the big infrastructure, we have all the European money that subsidized our big transport system, our treatment plants. But the big problem is that there is no political willingness to open up the roads and build the smaller sewers to connect into these systems. And this is something that is everywhere in the world the same problem. is like, how do you get governments to take action on these issues. And that you can only do by advocacy. And so I come back to my starting point, is that there is now a coalition, and that, that's why I think uh, it's very important that Borda takes the lead here, to actually make sure that the impetus that we have here on used water management goes beyond just empty words, uh, yearly declarations, that kind of stuff, because we know that it's on the, on the ground, the situation is just dramatic. Um, I also was, very intrigued by the comment that uh, Graham made about environmental infrastructure. And I think we have to also move away from uh, treating water as something that's completely invaluable and treating wastewater or used water as, as something that we have to get rid of. Um, there's so much more to that. And without going into too much details, I think from every perspective, be it for people, planet, be it for business and profit, be it for protection against climate change, we have to look at the value chain and see what the cost of inaction is. And I think that's a serious argument that we can actually promote much better. If you, if you read, um, for example, this week, uh, Melinda Gates published an, an open editorial in the Financial Times on Monday, the cost of inaction for women and children and the cost of not taking into account the, the, the efforts that they have to do for lack of water, for the fact that they have to go fetch firewood, all these kinds of stuff. So I think the cost of inaction, the cost of in condemning half of the world's workforce, females not being integrated enough in, for example, utilities and so forth, that's a real problem. So gender is, I think, one of the elements that will help us clarify these things. We all speak about infrastructure, about tarification, about sources of income, financing, that kind of stuff. We all know about the treaties, but I think there's a fourth T and it's the gender agenda. And I'm sorry to have to make this statement, but uh, I'm a man, but I'm also a father, I have a daughter. And I think the gender agenda in these discussions should also be much higher, much better promoted, not only by, for example, you know, people deal with menstrual problems, you know, the, the usual suspects, but it should be part of the conversation that we're having everywhere with everybody. So I think that's a key issue. The point I want to make now is about policy setting. And I think, of course, business is there. Uh, it will always find a way to make a profit. You, you, you all know about sanitation entrepreneurs. You know what big utilities do. 
performant ones, you know, there is failures. But there is, I think, what we need to make sure in this discussion about used water is that we have the right policies in place and that we can have inclusive, let's say, uh, transparent and multi-stakeholder processes leading up to these kind of policies that deal with the, uh, all, all aspects of used water, be it, uh, be it for protection for the environment, be it uh, water and sanitation service delivery, or be it for business. We need to have good quality policy in place. I think that's what's lacking, and it has to do with governance. And governance, it can only be done if everybody knows its right place. And I think business has grown up over the last 10 to 15 years, at least. If I look at my members, of course, they've very well grown up, they've very well behaved. But I think the wider business community is also growing up. But we're always, forgetting that's the point I was making in the beginning, is that we are not having everybody at the table that we should be talking to because a number of, of a huge portion is informal. So informal in, uh, let's say, the 40 failed states of the world, that's a recipe for disaster. And so our, our position is that we need to make sure that we can have those policies put in place and that we can um, build the good capacity. And I think the, this political willingness can go if, if, um, if there's a real, let's say, like a business case for politicians to deal with used water. And we've seen, I, see, I saw an example in Madagascar where the president took the water and sanitation agenda to the highest point of, uh, of, his, of his initiatives. They did a great job, but he was also out of office one year later. So that means that we have to also take into account that there is a big problem with these different cycles. We have political cycles, we have business cycles, we have natural cycles, and there is a disconnect there. So I think that is um, an area where we, together, coming to meetings like this, can actually can actually improve our understanding of what uh, what can be done. <coughs> so to conclude, there is hope. I think um, there are no known knowns. We know we're going to have to deal with this by 2030. But by 2050, it will be even more difficult if you look at the amount of energy that we're going to be needing, the amount of water that we're going to be needing extra to satisfy human uh, consumption, the amount of water that we're going to be polluting is going to be that needs to be treated. If you look at the environmental impacts that, uh, that are happening right now, including solid waste management, for example. But I think there is, an, an, there is an, a, a great capacity for innovation and a great capacity to use these, these new tools that we have. And I was talking about data. I think data is crucial. But I also think there is, there is a conversation that has sprung up, sprung up around wastewater, used water. And to my knowledge, this is the biggest audience I've ever seen talking about these issues. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, Stefan, but uh, I, I recall in Stockholm uh, it was much less. In Jordan we were maybe 25 people, which was not bad at all. But it's uh, really encouraging to see that we can spend two days together on this stuff. So without further ado, I will leave it to that. And uh, I'm looking forward to the debate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. So, now we know we have to think in terms of political cycles, business cycles, natural cycles, avoid, avoided costs, gender, we should think from a, a different perspective. So these are some of the key uh, messages. Another message is there is development, there is uh, development uh, in the community of practice, there are more and more people coming together at, uh, addressing the issue. So now we have five minutes for discussion and please come up with your questions. Just maybe one question regarding the, the private sector in the used water business. Would you, as we've heard in the beginning that a large part of the treatment plants are actually not working. There was this figure but about 1 in 25 that is really working. Do you think that in the private sector the idea of the, this problem is really being concentrated on? Because obviously if this, is, this is a very general data we have, but we should draw consequences from it. Is there an awareness about this problem in the private sector? Before you answer, could you quickly, um, Erich, say your name and uh, so that people can relate to you and what your background is? Thank my you. Name is, my name is Erich Suster. I've been working with government and also NGOs, mainly in Central and Latin America. 
sources of financing in order to get the infrastructure uh, done, whether it's on the greenfield development like uh, Lilo just suggested to, to get people somehow served. <coughs> I would like to know um, whether you think, um, Graham, you showed a business case where money was invested and it was grow leading to growth. Um, do we have um, business cases for, for investment? Um, and what are, would be key challenges? Is it institutional setup or regulation for for a blended uh, sources of money to cope with this infrastructure development requirement? Who would like to? <coughs> yes, Stefan, um, uh, I think it was in uh, Jordan that we, or was it in uh, Stockholm that we met with uh, Water.org? Mm -hmm. Uh, these guys are saying that they, they were able to raise impact investment funds and channel it very easily and they provided water and water services to 10 million people, mm -hmm. 10 million. And they were saying that they were talking about a 2% or 3% return on investment that they were projecting for their financiers and these guys are the big, the big trust funds, the big uh, foundations. Mm -hmm. And what I'm seeing, uh, at least uh, for example, in the Brussels community, is that there's a great appetite for this impact community to look at the sustainable uh, surface delivery, be it, be it water, sanitation, energy, also. And uh, so this is definitely going to grow. I don't have the total numbers in, in my in my mind, but uh, what is definitely sure is that there's a huge untapped potential there. Also, also if you look at other types of let's say capital investors that um, like uh, pension funds or so forth. Those, those are ambitioning different types of ethical values behind their investment. And I think it's for the sector, if you dare call it the sector, to actually tap into that, that money. And this will only come, in my view, uh, to the formal side. Uh, that's, that's a big problem there uh, with how to get the money there. And the formal side is there, but it's very inefficient. And we, know, we all know that there's a big, big need to support public utilities worldwide. I mean, if you compare the whole planet to 10 people, five of them get served by public utilities, one by the private sector, and four are unserved, right? So the unserved is, is a part, but I think impact investment, if we, can, if, we can find, if we can finally blend it together with other types of uh, capital, we can actually, if we can drive it to utilities to improve performance, then we can make a real difference, especially in urban areas. Mm -hmm. 